Hello, thanks for having me. Um, I just start with a really simple question. So, what is a musician? Well, a musician is someone who is playing music. That answer is kind of obvious, and there's more than that that should come to mind when we imagine musicians. Musicians are people who express themselves, people with a specific taste, people who need freedom in order to create their works, and uh, people who have the ability to touch us as listeners in a specific way. And the interesting thing is that this idea of the musician is already 200 years old, and it is still in our minds, no matter that a lot of things have changed since then. And currently we are facing another major change in the conditions of making music, and this is the digital revolution. And with this digital revolution, the idea of the musician that I just talked about needs to be updated. Musicians need to integrate the idea of creating participation in their work. And I want to show you three examples how we, as a Leipzig-based band called A Forest, and uh, the independent label Analog Soul, which I'm working for, created participation in music recently. But before, I want to take you on a quick tour through the idea of the musician, how it evolved and how it worked. And uh, the perfect starting point, therefore, especially here in Leipzig, is actually Johann Sebastian Bach. Because nowadays, we think about Bach as one of the brightest musicians of all times. But in his time, Bach was known as a skilled organ player, basically as a skilled life musician and a good teacher also. But why did his contemporaries and Bach himself did not think about him as a unique artist? Because that idea was not yet possible at the time. In 1685, when Bach was born, you became a musician like almost everybody got their jobs. You inherited it from your parents. The societies of the 7th century were strongly hierarchically organized. And the musician was a craftsman, somebody who served the societal needs for music. And basically, there were just two societal needs for music at the time. Music either served the aristocracy or the church. And Bach's job as Kenter at St. Thomas here in Leipzig was to praise, praise God each Sunday, each event of the church. So you could say the greatest composer in that time was God, and Bach as a musician was there to serve him. So musicians in Bach's times were not meant to express themselves musically. With the upcoming bourgeoisie, new societal needs for music occurred, and thereby new roles for musicians too. The citizens took the music out of the palaces and the churches, and they brought it in private salons and public operas, or even in this building here on the left, which was actually the home of the first Gewandhaus Orchestra. They played there for 30 years before they got their very own building in 1870. And with this societal change, the idea of music changed as well. It changed from an ideal of form, of traditional shape, like the menuet, to the ideal of the person, of the composer. So you can say the artists then took the center stage as unique individuals with a unique perspective on the world, with a unique ability to express themselves and with a sensitivity. And in music, that meant that the musician with the highest value was the composer who was playing his own works, interpreting, interpreting them on a solo instrument. And the great example, therefore, is Franz Liszt, who was not just a genius on the piano, but also a genius in professionalizing the personal cult around himself. In 1840, for example, he organized a European tour by horse carriage, and he paid all the expenses up front himself. And the first shows in Vienna and Prague, they were sensational success, but when he came to Leipzig, the first, concept, first concert flopped. 
And so he was in big trouble because he paid all the expenses up front. So what he did was he asked his friends and colleagues if they could help him. And Robert Schumann started writing reviews in the Leipzig newspapers praising the genius of Liszt and how great his concerts were. And Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi actually organized a mutual concert at the Gewandhaus. So they played there together and they played a Bach piece on two pianos. So what do we see there? We see that it is not enough to be a great pianist or a great composer, which Liszt undoubtedly was. But artists in the 19th century, they had to foster the image of themselves as virtuous genies. And Liszt was very good at that. Uh, for example, he prepared his pianos, and he prepared them in that way that they would break down when he played them. Just like the Rolling Stones threw their guitars in the amplifier. It's actually the same move. And this image of the musician as a certain disconnected genius from everyday life, this was actually the social function of the musician in that time. They embodied a different perspective on everyday life than just gainful work. 60 years later, or 100 years ago, this was the most sophisticated part of a bourgeois living room. And this is an automatic piano. And at the time, one of the greatest, one of the biggest companies worldwide for producing automatic pianos was here in Leipzig. It was the Ludwig Hupfeld AG, which employed 2,000 workers who produced 5 million piano rolls per year. Piano rolls are the storage medium which comes there in the center at the piano. So such an automatic piano is clearly not a genius, it is a machine. And thereby you can see that the distinctive potential of music changed from the concert to the possession of recorded music. In this time, music became a consumer product and a mass market existed. And this changed the roles for the musicians as well. De facto, most musicians of the 20th centuries became employees of big music labels. So technically, they still might have been freelance artists that expressed themselves in a way, but actually, they had been products of the industry. And the great example for this is Telefunken, a big German company actually building and selling radios, but in the 1950s, they founded a music label. And this music label offered a formal training to become a music star. So the trainees were chosen after their talent, and then they received a two-year formal training in singing, in dancing, and apparently also in making a nice duck face on photographs, because this is actually the most famous apprentice of this music star school by Telefunken. It's Freddie Quinn, who then landed 10 number one hits between 1956 and 1965 in the German billboards. And the interesting thing is, that despite the economical facts that the industry paid those artists who were merely interpreters in terms of just singing songs other people composed for them, the idea of the genius continued. Actually, the industry gave a lot of money to foster this idea, and it became part of the self-concept of the musicians and of us as audience too. But this model is not as solid as it looks. Actually, its groundings become fluent. Nowadays, every smartphone can store more music than a record shelf. Every one of us has more access to music than he or she could ever listen to. So music is not a solid product anymore. Music becomes fluent. Music becomes a service, just like water, like David Bowie said already in 2002. And thereby the well-established cycle of the music industry becomes more and more inadequate. It's not adequate anymore to create a star, to produce an album, to buy the promotion, to bring them on tour and to sell all the CDs. This won't work any longer. But there's also an interesting thing about the digital revolution. It gives musicians tools in order to regain power on the market because it has significantly become cheaper to produce and distribute your own music nowadays. 
you can upload it on SoundCloud for free, or on Bandcamp, or on the iTunes store, and sell it for 30% of the revenue. But in order to make use of these opportunities, we need to update the concept of the musician in our heads. So it's about bringing down walls in our heads. And there are three ways we can do this. We have to integrate the idea of participation in our idea of the musician. And I want to show you three ways. One is sharing, the other is versioning, and the third is representation. And sharing is the main concept, because you have to understand that in digital times, music exists to be shared. An MP3 is created to be small and easily shared. So you should not treat it as a solid property and put a DRM or something on it. Musicians gain reach and control when they make their music available on different platforms for low thresholds and even for free. One example we did with A Forest was we gave away the whole sample content of the album. That means not just single tracks, but every sample from the production. And so what happened was not that we sold less CDs and we hadn't been copied or something like this, but we received 15 great remixes by fans, by befriended musicians, and by musicians we hadn't known before. But this is not just about fan art. This is about changing the way musicians think about their music, think about their work. And my suggestion is to think about this work in terms of versions. It's totally okay to produce a great album all two to three years, but why don't we show what we do in between? We should not publish a closed masterpiece within long periods of time. This is not adequate in digital times. Instead, we should make the way to this masterpiece transparent and let the listeners participate in the process. And we did that with a forest in that way that we released early sketches of the songs. Ten months before the album was released, there were sketches on the website or a piano version of a song that later in the live set became a powerful song with a drum solo. Or we released a blog post with the lyrics for a song and an interview with the singer telling the story behind the song and things like this. And by this, the listeners become part of the project. It's exactly about participating in that stream, about commenting, about altering, about seeing the differences. So, music in digital times is still a product made by musicians, that's clear. But we should also find representations for the listeners as the meaningful, meaningful part of the project they are because no band or no musician ever could have made a living out of, it, out of his music without the listeners. That's simply not possible. But we became used to the idea of the passive consumer in the 20th century, and the musicians became used to that idea too, actually. But representation instead can break this up, and it can help to sensitize for the conditions of making music within the audience. So, what we as a forest did was a merely symbolic move. We created a symbolic currency um, showing the value different projects, different products had for the band. So one YouTube click was one seed, similar to one cent. And uh, a sold CD was 10 leaves, similar to 10 euros. And 10 concert guests were a tree, similar to 100 euro. So this, this is just symbolic, right? The, the musicians were still paid in euro. But this helped to shift the focus from consuming music to enabling music. And my main point is that these steps actually pay off for musicians. One example is by sharing, we created very low thresholds to access the music. You could download the album on the website of the band for free, or you could name a price. And most concerts were also name your price or pay what you want. And on average, 
we gained four euro per download. And if the consumer would have bought the album for five euro on the iTunes store, the artist would have had two euro 27. But the most significant change was in directly sold physical records. We managed to increase this number of directly sold vinyls and CDs on the band website or on concerts by 85%. And that raises the benefit for the artist from 13% to 66. And despite the differing prices of both products, wherever they were sold, at Amazon or at the band website, this triples the income for the artist by physical records. And another example is that by versioning and representation, we created a kind of community idea around the band. And this changed the way we ourselves thought about live touring. We did not just ask our fans in which cities they live and where we should play. We also asked them if they knew a cool venue or a cool club the music would fit in. And we even asked them if they knew a promoter who would organize the show or if they want to be the promoter themselves. And this raised the average audience by a third within just one tour over four weeks. So I'm telling you this because I want to strengthen the idea of the independent artist in the 21st century who is closely interconnected to his audience through digital media. And digital media thereby is not endangering music. It opens up a dozen new channels and thereby new chances to get listened to and to get in contact with people. So there are a few further examples on imaforest.com and we could not be happier if you go there and check them out, discuss them, criticize them, adapt them, develop your own, because we strongly think that integrating the idea of participation in our image of the musician is the only adequate recipe for being a musician in the 21st century. Thank you.